I, I'm a champion for change. What you have to come to the realization of at some point in time is that um, sometimes the only thing you can change is, you know, the position that you put yourself in. There's so many careers. If you, you know, our, we have veterinarians in all careers, like veterinarians are doing so much these days. Hi, I'm Dr. Sprinkle, and you are listening to the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Today, you will meet Dr. Heather Kavitko White. She's a boarded veterinary internist who has experienced a range of ways to be a veterinarian, from academia to private practice to owning her own consulting company called KW Consulting, to teaching a creative, common sense approach to animal care without sacrificing quality, i.e., pragmatic medicine. But in this conversation, you get to know the true Heather. Like many veterinarians from a young age, she was an achiever who got to the point, like we all usually do, where she didn't have a plan in her career. She believes in having a team of advisors and isn't afraid to have a respectful stink when it comes to living out her values. She's learned that her belief in practical medicine is also a good strategy when making decisions for her own life and career. Let's talk with Heather. So what do you remember from such a young age that attracted you to veterinary medicine? Yeah, you know, I'm such a lifer, right? That like what at five, other than, you know, being a five-year-old kid and like the idea of working on animals kind of really attracts me to that. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. I just know that, um, you know, every little exposure that I had, um, you know, at different ages, like I think probably take your daughter to work day, right? Or take your child to work day um, in whatever grade that is, fourth or fifth. You know, I, I know I went to a veterinary hospital and um you know I vividly remember you know that they did a a a little tiny uh necropsy on a little parakeet and you know like just seeing kind of multifocal lesions in there whether that was cancer or granulomatous disease who knows I don't know but like those types of experiences that uh you know for some people are like the no, I'm running out the door. And, you know, for me, it was just always like a cumulative, like, yes, I want to come back, show me more. Um, And I think on some level, I understood, you know, what my doc, my dad did and that, you know, teeth are gross. And I certainly didn't want to follow in his footsteps and be a dentist. Right. So like there was, you know, even if he would have maybe thought about that for me. Right. So I think there was just a little bit of rebellion, like, you know, not that direction, but my similar different ones. Yeah. So some shared interests, but curious about pursuing a slightly different way of medicine and science. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, the dreams, right, to be around animals as a kid. (laughs) Absolutely. So what was kind of your, your journey up to vet school? Were there any really neat moments that kind of helped you be, be a person and start to get ready for this career ahead of you? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I think I was a, you know, like a, an achiever and like a really good little pre-vet student that, you know, specifically targeted, you know, different experiences in order to kind of come in with somewhat of a broad exposure. So, you know, I did all of the things that, you know, needed to be done at that time to be a strong candidate for vet school, right, which is like have the grades and, and, you know, I mean, I've been out for a while now. So a lot of these admissions processes have changed. But, you know, certainly at the time, it was a very formulaic, like, have the exposure, you know, work at a vet practice, you know, have good letters and and get good grades, right? And you're in. So, um, but that allowed me to have really neat experiences, um, you know, following around an equine veterinarian for a summer when uh, in college, when that's something that I had no exposure to really growing up and, and things like that. So yeah, many failed attempts to get in at a zoo, right? <laughs> like all kids, like we all had, <laughs> like, just let me in. <laughs> yep. Uh, that was me too. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, yeah. But you were able and you got accepted into the Ohio State yeah. University for vet school. What was vet school like for you? Yeah, I mean, I loved, you know, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, right? So um, I had gone really so far away to the University of Dayton for undergrad, you know, which is 80 miles away. Um, So I was, you know, kind of coming back home and moving into an apartment and living in my city for the first time alone. And, um, 
you know, so that was just a great experience. I, you know, I met my husband during vet school and, you know, I was involved in, you know, OTS and the internal medicine club. And, you know, again, I think I was like, you're happy, you're, you're like traditional little achiever who kind of knew that I wanted to specialize. Right. And that I had boxes to tick off. Um, you know, so I was all, I was, um, kind of really absorbed in like life at that time, but it was really, you know, it was, it was good. Right. I like learning. So I loved every aspect of it. We didn't track at Ohio state back in the day. I loved all my time in the barn. Um, even my three week long preventative med class that most people, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're like, Oh, the people you hear like such a waste of time, but I just loved every moment. Yeah. And I think I read that, uh, you really decided, yep. Internal medicine was for me when you were on your clinical rotations. Is that correct? Yeah, so I really like I kind I knew I wanted to specialize. Um, my dad is not a specialist as a dentist, you know, he's not an oral surgeon or any of those things. So um, you know, I kind of came across that really out in the world as a, a veterinary assistant, you know. Um, but I just didn't, I really loved cardio. And I think, you know, to this day, and I, I would, I will happily tell him to his face. Like, I think what I really, really loved was John Bonagura, Dr. Bonagura at Ohio state, who's just such a fabulous teacher. And, um, you know, I had the vote to talk about amazing opportunities. This is almost even hard to believe at this point in time, but when I was in vet school, cardiology was an elective and, um, in just a weird twist of fate, you know, my group of clinic, uh, of colleague of classmates that I was rotating around with on the clinics, um, they had varied interests that were not really small animal. And so I was the only one of the six or seven of us to take car uh, cardio that rotation. So I did two weeks with Dr. Bonagura and, um, the resident at the time. And, um, and, you know, I mean that if, if you can think of an experience for someone who's a budding cardiologist, that would kind of solidify that, right? That's it. And, uh, you know, I was able to scrub into the cath lab, just simply a numbers game that most vet students don't get access to. So, um, you know, I think it was kind of comparing that those two weeks to, you know, my rotation on medicine where I had felt so kind of like challenged and invigorated and you know, each case was a little bit new and different. Um, and so that's what really solidified it for me. So it kind of sounds like you, you knew your track, you, you knew you were going to specialize. And of course, when it comes to specialties, you have to do internships and all those things. Where, how was that time of, for you kind of doing those advanced yeah, I mean, that was, that was challenging. You know, my husband and I had met at the very beginning of grad school. He was a grad student at Ohio State. Um, he's not a veterinarian, so um, he's a professor. And, in, um, you know, but at the time was a grad student and trying to look at internships and we were getting married and like, you know, I mean, it's hard. Um, and, and uh, you know, I really ranked a lot based on location, to be quite honest. And against the advice of some of my mentors, I think, you know, at, at the time I may have even disappointed some of them with my choices, you know, but, um, I did, I ended up at Purdue, um, and, you know, it's still a fantastic program. Like how lucky am I, you know, that I would lived in Columbus, Ohio, and I had all these really great programs within a reasonable driving distance, you know, but it's, it's very different, right. In other parts of the country. So, um, so I, I did my year at Purdue and, um, in a time where they didn't have even primary emergency yet, which meant that all we had were tertiary referral cases. So these were like really sick animals. Um, so what a great place for a budding internal medicine specialist to be doing like full pneumonia workups in the middle of the night and, you know, full blood work and collecting blood cultures and imaging and stuff. So a very different internship experience than most people have had. I, I never unblocked a cat, you know, like until I was in my residency. Um, yeah, so then I matched um, at Texas. You know, my husband and I were still trying to juggle his, at that point in time, postdoc with you know, I guess what would be my postdoc. And, um, you know, we lived apart for those four years. We managed to live close, like Columbus to, you know, West Lafayette was about six hours. And then, um, 
you know, my biggest thought when I matched at Texas A&M, which was kind of a safety school for me, if I'm being honest, was like, we didn't really have anything lined up for my husband yet for a postdoc. Um, and, you know, he uh, was really supportive, though. And he was like, give me a day and I'll figure it out. And um, and he did. And he got a fantastic postdoc at a great lab in Austin. And of course, we had to be willing to live apart more than we live together and have two households and things. Um, but, it, you know, it was really serendipitous experience, I think, for both of us. So not at all. What, I mean, I was one of the only, I was the only person to match for a residency, actually, in my internship class. It was just a difficult year. Um, and to like be aware of how amazing it is that you matched and then, but also deal with the emotions of like, I don't know how we're going to make this work, you know? Um, and it's, you know, people make different choices. My resident mate chose to only rank a very small list of schools, um, but then was able to scramble and, and ended up at Texas A&M the next year. And, you know, like, um, you know, so it, that's obviously a big deal when you're going through <laughs> that phase of life. And it's especially hard when you, when you're attached to someone, when you have a relationship already, you know, if you do. So. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit more just about the, you, you thought you might have disappointed some of maybe your professors and dealing with you know, making some career choices and in, in, in working with your husband. Do you mind just sharing a little, maybe some advice for, for people who might be going through this? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, yeah, you, I mean, you just have to decide, right? Like, I mean, again, I feel like I'm coming from such a privileged position because I'm sitting here saying like, oh, you know, poor Heather, I had to choose between, you know, Purdue University and, and Pen or something, you know what I mean? So, um, but one of the things that I've kind of learned throughout this experience, or really, I guess, come to consider is um, if you have any inkling like of what you want to do at the end, you know, and it's okay not to, but if you're one of these people that kind of already sees yourself, like, you know, perhaps you're already. Uh, in a committed relationship, maybe you're already living like where you want to live or where you see raising a family and that type of stuff, you know, kind of look for the opportunities that are really the quickest means to an end, right? You know, my goal was to stay in academia and right. So um, sticking within academia was, is necessary, was necessary really um, at the time, you know, we know we can be a little bit more flexible, but I, I do tend to agree with the sentiment that um, it's really hard to get back into academia once you've left. Um, so, you know, but that, that limited my choices, but it doesn't tie my hands. And, you know, um, in my specific situation, I think I was probably very well set up to do an internship under the, you know, uh, plan of potentially becoming a cardiologist, you know, at, you know, other universities. And, um, you know, I just went with what was going to make my young marriage survive. And it was a hard year. It was a really hard year. And I can't imagine what it would have been like if I was m more than a drive away. Yeah. Did you have um, mentors or friends or people around you? Yeah. I mean, I've always like always collected a stable of mentors and, you know, I've now learned later in my career, like, you know, it's kind of like having a personal advisory board. And, and now I actually do to some extent, um, very consciously think about, you know, who are, uh, the people that I'm, uh, reaching out to and who are the people that are advising me. Um, and this is how I've been. This is how I was as a student and an intern and a resident is like, collect all the opinions. Tell me everything you think, like, what are your thoughts? What do you recommend? What were your experiences? And then um, whether it's what I'm going to do with my life or what I'm going to do with this patient at the end, I kind of formulate my decision based on all the information that I have. So I've always been like this opinion collector, um, you know, and that doesn't mean, you know, I can get an opinion from one mentor and, and 
be very thankful and appreciative of that opinion and, and leave the phone call and be like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. um, but it's really important to hear various perspectives. So I couldn't function without the people that are involved in my life as my mentors. And, and that includes peer mentorship, peer to peer mentorship. Um, and, uh, you know, now I'm kind of reaching a phase in my life where I have a, some kind of mentee type relationships of my own too. So. Yeah. Well, I hope we can get into those. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so from your, your internships and your residency, um, what was it like you becoming certified your, your licensed internist? What was the next step of your journey? Yeah. I mean, I like, just like that school, I loved my time in my residency and I had really great teachers and mentors in my residency. Um, in particular people that had been out in practice and, and, you know, uh, kind of really got it, what it's like to, um, you know, operate, I guess, outside of the teaching hospital. Um, so I loved every minute. It was, it's of course hard work. Like, I don't even know in hindsight how we could, how we did that, how I did the hours, how my dogs did the hours, you know, like I just, um, you know, and, but it was, um, you know, it was, it was good. I had a really supportive teaching environment with great resident mates. And, you know, these are not things that every person is guaranteed when they go through their experience. Like, you know, um, at the end of the day, right. The, the best thing you can hope for is to find, uh, colleagues and, and friends and mentors, right. That you just naturally connect with, but, um, you know, that may or may not be the case. So, you know, it's, it's a high pressure environment and it brings out the worst of everybody. Um, and so it's a really important learning environment. And, um, you know, you just kind of, for me, I just like, I'm like a sponge for information. So, you know, for instance, a lot of times in the morning, my resident mates would run off to like make phone calls and get their day started and organize and stuff like that. And I like to hang out in the back of the room while the professors did student rounds because, you know, at a very minimum, I was learning how they presented information to students, right? Even if I had heard it all before at that point in time. So um, yeah, so just lots of opportunities to, to learn and see and watch and grow in that environment. Definitely relate on the learning uh, aspect of that. And especially it sounded like you were interested in academia. So that's very valuable to learn how to teach uh, as yeah. well. Yeah. So what were you looking for after your residency and then in your next step for your career? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I, I wanted, uh, I really envisioned myself, um, you know, staying in academia. And, you know, of course, my husband and I, um, him being an academic as well, you know, we would kind of fantasize, I guess, about going back to Ohio State because, um, you know, universities that do what he does, there was a reason that we were both there at the same time, right? And, um, you know, but when it was time, he was looking at basically his first faculty job out of a postdoc now. And, um, you know, it was a very different environment. We, I mean, there were few academic jobs and you mostly would get them through being in the right place at the right time. So kind of like a resident graduating up into a clinical instructor, you know, to fill a void. And then, and, and some of those people are like the best, you know, there's, you know, still teaching, you know, today, like they're great, fabulous clinicians that were taught by great, fabulous clinicians. But, you know, that was, we weren't going to stay in Texas. And right. So we just, we ended up somewhere else and it just happened to be Syracuse, New York. And, you know, that was a place where there was one specialty clinic. They were not hiring. Um, I literally had to call them up out of the blue and be like, my name is Heather. I'm moving to the area. I don't know what I'm doing with my life, but presumably it's going to involve practicing internal medicine, right? And, you know, I'm an analytic, like, planner, and I think my mentors at my residency were just flabbergasted that I had no plan, you know, and no job, and we were just moving. Um, yeah, so it was a very different experience than what I expected when I finished my residency. And, um, you know, so in a period of time, that was like, six months 
everything changed. You know, we moved out of Texas, two different households in Texas. We were, we had no place that we were building a house. We had no place to live for a while. You know, we were just like, you know, all our life was in a pod for about six months. And, um, you know, the practice was, you know, they were, they, they were smart, right? They said like, this girl's going to come and practice medicine. So I started at two and a half days a week. That's what I started at, um, building a practice. And they, they took a gamble on me and, um, you know, there was already an internist there. It was just like the practice was really struggling to grow in volume. So I found myself doing something extremely different than what I had been doing, which was really building a practice, doing a lot of sitting around, doing a lot of like building what does the medicine service look like and training technicians and inventory, you know, just um, even at one point in time, helping to design a new scope room, you know, um, or getting to what a privilege, right? Um, so, uh, but it was really hard. Nobody really prepares you for what it looks like going from working 80 hours a week to two and a half days a week as like a busybody who's been checking boxes your whole life, yeah, you know? yeah. um, or teaches you how to build a practice or, you know, even maintain your own scope equipment. You know, I did not know, right? And you become an instant authority, you know, of the newest academician to enter the building that's supposed to know all the current up-to-date everything and you know you've come to find out that everything you do is kind of like jury rigged together in the real world right your equipment you know and trying to do an esophageal balloon and you can't inflate it like it's very frustrating I think once you get out into practice going from that academic world where everybody does everything for you and anesthesia plans your plan and your students move your patients throughout the hospital and you know and then all of a sudden you're doing everything 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 you know um you're calling labs and setting up accounts because this practice is not used to sending things to the GI lab for instance right and you're like oh my god I was just trained there I can't possibly function without that ability you know so it was just a uh, it was like a crazy time and then you know adding that to me the pressure of uh supporting myself right this concept of like these people are paying me money and I need to be producing something to be right? Kept around. Um, and you need to show constant growth in even working with a management team that was so wonderful, um, in the way that they taught me, um, what contracts look like and what production numbers are and why my terms were the way that they were and what that meant, you know, on the back end of the financials. And, um, so I was really lucky because I, I went, I was, I got that kind of on the job training. I ended up in a specialty uh, emergency clinic that was privately owned so um yeah and, and long story short it was like a it was very different and I in at in 2015 like a year after I left school uh, or left my residency I put in to give a talk at ACDIM with my uh, former faculty who had finally left after about five years of being one of these former residents now clinical assistant professors with a one-year contract that they can never get any job security. Um, she left at the same time and we were both just like, so uh, we hatched a scheme to kind of share what that transition was like for us um, for the first time. And um, that conversation has been had at Forum, you know, a couple times now, I've been, three times now I've been involved in it twice. I was having a baby the third time. Um, but really, I think those conversations back in 2015 were some of the first conversations about how the transition from academia to practice is greatly impactful for young professionals as far as well-being and burnout. And, um, and you know, so that's something that's still important to me today. Yeah. So what resulted from those conversations? Well, you know, it was interesting, um, you know, not a lot uh, that I'm aware of specifically, but you never know. Um, for instance, the first time we did it and we got a, just a horrible time slot, right? This is a candidate function and it was held, they held our, our time slot was like Friday at 6 PM or something. Just, Where everybody's you know, gone so home. The, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, and it's hard to put these agendas together, of course, you know, and I don't, you know, we were just, I was just a, like a nobody that was like, I have something to say, you know? Um, so, but I know, for instance, Todd Tams, who was, you know, 
very high up with VCA at the time, you know, was there. And so like, what might have sparked from having those conversations, I have no idea, but, um, you know, I, I, Barb Kitchell, uh, she was there, you know, a practice owner and an oncologist, right? There were people that, um, you know, so I think any conversation, whether there's a hundred people in the room or 10 people in the room, I've found can spark amazing things over time. So, oh. I love that message. And yeah. message is don't be afraid to stay until Friday night and go to those resident talks. <laughs> so, oh, a lot of value right yeah. there. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you were able to have these conversations and I, I firmly believe, I'm sure you have, you helped somebody and, and sparked some, some good actions to help those transitions. Um, but what was next for you? What were? Yeah. I mean, so we, uh, we kind of, got into that, the phase of, uh, well, my husband and I had struggled with infertility for almost the whole time up at this point in time. And, you know, perhaps you and I can talk about that another time, but kind of the, um, the impact on the female body in particular of kind of like, you know, going through such a stressful and rough, uh, you know, cortisol releasing period of time, and then kind of delaying fertile years and things like that. I mean, we could talk you know, forever, uh, kind of about that. But, you know, unfortunately, it's an all too common story that I hear a lot with people that kind of end up in school for a long time, you know, we're in our 30s now, and our bodies don't work like maybe we once thought that they would. So, you know, that was our unexpected experience that is unfortunately far too common. Um, And I like to talk about it, because again, awareness, um, uh, and just to know that, uh, you know, that's a struggle. that there are other people going through in our profession and elsewhere. Um, and when we finally got pregnant and, you know, and, and then we had our second daughter was kind of a surprise, like a two for one, you know, these stories that you hear that really are true, um, that seem to be true at least, um, you know, so then it was really the pull to kind of move back home and, um, Ohio State and a faculty job for me, for my husband, he hadn't been away far enough for long enough at that time for them to ever consider bringing him back, you know, now as a big adult. So, um, so we ended up in Kansas City, Missouri, where he's from. And I kind of knew I was a little bit disenfranchised with practice already in Syracuse. Um, you know, I described how it was so different uh, from what I was used to. Um, and, and my frustrations were always like actually practicing good medicine under budget limitations and with uh, equipment limitations and with staff limitations. You know what I mean? It's like a daily grind. It's just a daily grind if you're really trying to just do as good as you can. Um, It's so so many people kind of suffer through like this rinse and repeat of like, oh my God, today was so hard and frustrating. You know, we were overbooked or I feel bad that I didn't get to do this or, you know, I'm out here without fluoroscopy or, or, or CT. So am I doing bad by scoping these dogs that are, you know, ballooning them without a bag, you know, a, a working pressure thing and without CT, right? So there's a lot of like feelings that you go through. Um, but when we moved to Kansas City and, um, and I thought to myself, like, I, I just need to try for again, right? You can't assume everything you've been working towards is not going to work out after one job. So, you know, I, I worked here in Kansas City and I just still found myself kind of um, really just frustrated with um, kind of the entrenchment that I see, um, you know, uh, because it's so hard, you know, holding up to a certain standard of medicine when you feel like you're just like scraping up a, a like a tree, everything, and you're getting pushback from the people in charge. And you know what I mean? You're like, I need this because I and uh, and finances and and uh, business finances and just a lot of things just make it so difficult to enjoy you know what you're doing and I've you know this is just very recent of kind of my personal like professional journey which is something that started back in 2018 for me um and I will just I'll preface it by saying I'm one of those people like I'm really motivated by patient outcomes and I'm really motivated by improving patient outcomes and how we can do that through education, um, with both in school and after school. And, um, you know, that being whether that's uh, veterinary school or residency training, right? 
Um, but I know there's something more that drives me because like, I've always had this kind of behind the scenes underlying like background level of, you know, kind of wanting to make a really respectful stink about things. You know what I mean? Like, love that. <laughs> you know, like, stink. you know, just like this always like, I, it shouldn't be this way, you know? So this kind of draw to leadership, um, that's been a journey because in, you know, learning about yourself and what your strengths and weaknesses are. And, you know, so I've been, since I was a child, like drawn to leadership, but like with all the wrong approaches and, you know, behaviors and, um, you know, so it's a journey of kind of like, you know, what do you want to do? And then what's the best way to get there? And what skills do you have? And what skills have you lacked? And what's held you back in the past? So yeah, in 2018, um, one of my mentors uh, provided me with the opportunity to go to the Veterinary Innovation Summit, which is a really neat meeting that they have um, that's sponsored by industry and a lot of, um, you know, thought leaders and really innovative people. Megan, you've probably been there. Yep. Or if you haven't, <laughs> yep, yep. A lot of like, you know, really amazing people that um, are not all veterinarians, you know, um, but kind of come together collectively to collaborate and innovate and kind of think of new ideas, you know. So, I mean, that was like finding, finding another home, finding a group of people that has been there this whole time working very hard on some of the issues that I feel about our profession that I just didn't even know existed. Um, and so that really kind of set the stage for me finding really specific focused mentorship in, you know, what do the other career fields look like and what are the opportunities for me? And, you know, it's been years, it's been a couple of years now. I mean, that was 2018, right before the pandemic. And, um, you know, it's 2000, early 2022 now, and I'm still on a journey of figuring out exactly what that looks like. Um, but I, I left practice in September of 2020. And other than going back in and doing some locuming um, or maybe occasional relief work, um, and I'm not ruling it off the list at all, you know, like this, I mean, really, I think you just hone in on what you really enjoy doing. Um, and if you spend a little bit each day thinking about like, what part of your current job do you like, you know, what parts do you, could you do without, and then trying to envision what your life would look like doing just the parts you enjoy doing. Um, that's kind of the journey that I'm on right now. So is it 2020 that you started the pragmatic professor? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. And I, again, I, I didn't really realize I've used the words pragmatic medicine for a long time, just to describe the approach to things that I kind of invented for myself when I went from academia with like all the tools and toys and equipment to, you know, a practice that had, um, you know, a surgeon and two criticalists, which is amazing, two criticalists, um, you know, myself, so one and a half medicine doctors, myself being the half, you know, and a part-time oncologist and a part-time radiologist. So, you know, I was practicing half the time without ultrasound and I was never trained how to do ultrasound, you know? Um, so yeah, just kind of the methods that I established and working within often restricted budgets. And, you know, I heard yesterday, um, from someone I was speaking to that, you know, history always has a tendency of repeating itself. And, you know, I think you see this movement, not just me and saying, okay, we're going to do practical cost conscientious medicine, um, you know, but with spectrum of care and access to care and um, incremental care and collaborative care and all of these things, which, you know, so history has a way of repeating itself. And I think what we're finding is that we really do need to kind of get back to the basics of medicine you know, physical exam, history, signalment, you know, uh, kind of routine diagnostic database. So, you know, that's what I really try and teach people is just actionable, approachable, and you could call it internal medicine, or you could even just call it general medicine, you know, like what people really want to know, what people really need to know about um, these complicated disease processes and managing them on a day-to-day, -day, often on a budget, you know, um, and 
you know, with, I have the general belief that just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean that we should, you know, and that each scenario and each decision should be really factored on that patient and that client at that moment of time in their lives um, with their financial capabilities that they have at that moment. And, you know, the parallel is only just kind of reaching to me today, that that's kind of how I'm making the decisions in my life too, about what work I'm taking and what projects and what I'm looking for is, um, you know, kind of factoring in as much of the evidence and data as possible, you know, into a reasonable plan. Um, yeah. So that's what I've been doing. And, and it really fits you having this conversation, getting to know you, it, it makes perfect sense for you. So with this, this mission and this passion that you had, how did you make that your career? Yeah, I mean, I just at some point in time, I just had to leave. And I, I did not have a plan. But I had at that point in time been thinking about this and working on, um, you know, my own values, my own mission and purpose and drive and I'm something I'm still figuring out. I don't think anybody like figures that out. But um, so doing some really serious foundational research with the guidance of mentors, which I think is the first step for anyone, you have to really do some inner assessment. And it's uncomfortable, right? Like being like, okay, Heather, you know, what are your strengths and weaknesses, right? And are you better uh, leading a group? Are you better doing independent work, you know, um, advising a team? Um, you know, uh, or, you know, participating you know what I mean? Or being the group leader and, and things like that. And, um, and also really thinking about what my priorities are um, in life, including family and, you know, making a decision to live in a place with no veterinary teaching hospital, which was a very formative decision when we did it. Like I understood what that meant, you know, when we said we would live in Kansas City. And on some level, I understood that there's a lot of industry here and that, you know, if clinical medicine wasn't going to work out for me, I was going to have to find a non-traditional path. So, um, you know, I've been a lifelong networker and connector and, um, you know, so I basically just jumped, you know, I, I, I found out there was an opportunity to do some locuming and, um, and that was, uh, well-timed enough with my financial capabilities um, that it would buy me about a four-month period of time to just like start tapping into my network and seeing what was out there, right? So um, so that's what I did. And then, you know, from then until now, and it's still my every day on any one day, like I could have a call like this. I could be, um, you know, yesterday I was talking to, uh, you know, high up leadership thinking to myself, how did I get on this phone call? You know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, or I'm making content, you know, or, or I'm, I'm just the nose to the grindstone making PowerPoint presentations to go out and kind of teach this style of medicine to people. So, um, and monetizing, you know, what you love to do. Um, it's, uh, and, and the financial risk and, the, and all of those things, you know, whether I were to open a practice or basically support myself as a business, which is what I'm kind of doing right now, there's a lot of uh, financial risk and planning. And, you know, so my vision for kind of my future just looks a little different, you know, and that's kind of, that's it. I mean, you just at some point in time have to get brave enough and, and it helps when you feel like this is enough is enough. And I don't like the person that I am when I'm in my current situation. Ooh, that is a good measure is, is, do you like yourself in the position you are in? I think that's a really good North star to, yeah. to feel. And I think people, you know, I'm a change agent, right? Like I'm a champion for change. And I think, you know, of what you have to come to the realization of at some point in time is that, um, sometimes the only thing you can change is, you know, the position that you put yourself in. And, um, you know, so really evaluating and that doesn't always have to mean moving. I think a lot of people think a career change, a job change comes with moving, um, you know, but you may have to just kind of think about <laughs> other options. And there's so many careers. If you, you know, our, we have veterinarians in all careers, like writing and marketing and 
you know, just people, veterinarians are doing so much these days. So yeah, public policy, I mean, whatever really interests you. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go get more education, but I'm kind of currently in a phase where I'm like, you know, what other skills do I need? What other training? You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's that learner in you too. It's coming out. What else can I learn? Exactly. So what are you most excited about right now? Um, you know, I, uh, we're getting back to having in-person meetings and, um, I do really, I'm an, I'm an introvert. I'm a 50% introverted extrovert, like, and I'm a pretty strong introvert. Um, but I really do love meetings. And I really think that goes back to veterinary school. You know, when I, I was a student rep for North American Vet Conference back in the day. And Mia Carey was in charge of that program. And they were, you know, they invited us and they treated us like VIP and the experience of having a cohort of people that you see when you go and you travel and you're learning and you're engaging and having, you know, having conversations together. I love that experience. Um, you know, I've learned how to manage it for my introverted self. So like I've learned some tips like staying off site and, you know, to, you know, to really um, kind of get the best me, the best version of myself in that environment, which um, that environment can be really high pressure to kind of keep going and stay up late at night and not take care of yourself. So, um, so I love meetings. I love how meetings and collaboration and networking come together with learning. Um, and so anytime I get to be involved in kind of agenda planning, um, greater meeting strategy, you know, what can we like shake up? What conversations can we have? Um, you know, what are things that I'm curious to learn about and what other people might be in trends. So that's the stuff that kind of gets me really excited. Yeah. Is there a particular conference that's coming up that you're looking forward to? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, like I said, the innovation summit was really exciting meeting for me. Um, just meeting industry and these are folks that are, have startups and, you know, so there, um, there's a lot of tech people and just like a really different crowd of, of um, brain power and just the way that people work, you know, like for instance, I learned um, that we veterinarians just have high levels of neuroticism and, um, and how that's not necessarily a bad thing. It makes us really good at being veterinarians, you know, but being at an industry meeting with, you know, people who are not veterinarians and being like, oh, oh my gosh, is that the word to describe me? You know, like, yes, I am neurotic, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll be presenting about pragmatic medicine at ACVIM Forum this year in the summer, which is exciting for me because it's the first time I'm actually giving that message to fellow um, specialists. I'm usually on the lecture circuit speaking to general practitioners. Um, and yeah, so those are kind of the things. And uh, I have some, you know, there's always some secret projects involved where I might be weaving some connections behind the scenes to see what content can be put together. Yeah, no, that's the fun part of it. And I will be at ACVIM, so I will have Yay! to make sure to to find your talk. And yes, yeah, we'll be there. Yeah. In, I'll be there virtually and in person. I'll be there. I'm, I'm actually doing a uh, talk about boundaries with one of my mentors, Dr. Wendy Hauser, who was really formative for me. I'm um, kind of starting to set my priorities and values. So we're, we're doing that for candidates on Wednesday, um, which is specialty day at the meeting. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, another one of these kind of resident specific events that, you know, um, where we really do try and talk about life skills, not just um, journal article papers. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we had this conversation then. So I, I can yeah. make sure that people will be looking out for your talks if they're headed to ACVIM um, or if they're tuning in virtually. Uh, so excited for you for that. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Any um, kind of final advice or, or, or just anything that's on your heart right now that you want to say to the veterinary profession? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, you know, and we'll, we're going to talk about this in our personal boundaries talk too. Um, but I, I, I think it's really easy to kind of look at the situation that you find yourself in and think, um, 
you know, that everything around you needs to change, you know, um, like if we were just doing it this way or, you know, if I could just get this or have this piece of equipment or whatever. And I think people get really kind of entrenched and, you know, just like I said, you know, frustrated and you're going to a situation where you, you kind of know it's really impacting your joy. Um, and, you know, I had, there is so much instability in my life when I was practicing. Um, and I still have a lot of instability in my life. You know, like, I don't know what I will be doing three months from now. Um, but my, my, my person, my, I, you know, whether it's your soul, your spirit, your, you know, just who you are, who Heather is as a spouse, as a mom, um, you know, this is, uh, this is just what I need to be doing right now. And, um, and kind of, you know, recognizing, recognizing where you really are and, and kind of making the decisions, you know, there's a concept called ruinous empathy, right? Where, you know, like I, you know, you read some of these leadership books and uh, yes, we have a, we have a kitty and a dog visitor. Yes. Um, but yeah, this concept of if we just ignore the problem, like I'll adjust to it or it'll go away. Right. And, um, and that's really damaging actually to ourselves and to other people. Um, so, you know, when I left practice thinking, if I go, all these people are going to come down with me. Um, you know, like when I left day services at my location closed down, like having that type of pressure of I'm responsible for these four employees and half of the animals in my town, you know, what happens if I go and there's nobody to do ultrasounds. And I think that holds people, you know, in their spot, but we don't really answer to anyone, but our loved ones at the end of the day. And every single person who I was worried about when I made the decision I needed to do for me, every one of them is in a better place now because we were all kind of holding ourselves down. Um, so sometimes like change really is like, it's a shakeup and uh, whether you need to like ink it in writing somehow, or, you know, make an investment in yourself that you can't take back or whatever, like kicking the took us, you need to like really make that first step. And sometimes for me, it has been a financial thing. Like if I don't, you know, do this, I will never do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, just, just understand, um, you know, don't get stuck in your own misery and, and, um, you know, and, and also don't think that you're responsible for how other people feel about their lives and their long-term view. That is definitely a message. A lot of veterinarians need to hear. <laughs> um, I, I have found you and a, a very relatable, I think, uh, not only to myself, but I can, I know that a lot of veterinarians have had a lot of these same feelings. So I'm glad that you came to talk today. Um, yeah. I do have a final few questions to call them rapid fire questions to, yes. to end the session with you. Um, so what is one thing on your bucket list? Oh my gosh. Going to Australia. Oh, then it's fantastic. <laughs> I know I'm obsessed. My, my, my girls love the show Bluey and I've become obsessed with the idea of like living in Brisbane. <laughs> nice. This looks nice. like heaven. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, what is a simple moment that brings you joy? Um, honestly, um, and this, like I have like the cat and the dog, you can't really see them here. They're slightly off screen, but my lifelong dream of having a cat and dog that just like love each other and play all the time. And, you know, like, like just looking at them, I'm like, oh, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Perfection and peace. Yeah. Uh, if you could create one law that everyone had to follow, what would your law be? Oh my goodness. Um, merging like a zipper. What do you mean? Say more. Oh, like when you're driving in a car, right? And you have oh. to merge. Merging like a zipper, one and then the other and then the other and then the other. That would be the law. Yes. A amen. We're going to put that on a bumper sticker. Um, right. Because like, if you, you know, right. Whenever anybody's talking about people can't drive in whatever city it's because of merging. So yes. Learn how to drive people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and finally, what is one thing you are grateful for? 
I'm, I'm honestly, I'm grateful that I have like a really supportive spouse and family that, um, you know, kind of, uh, have been supporting me through this crazy idea to, you know, after, uh, taking all this time to become a specialist and practicing, you know, as a specialist in private practice for seven years to kind of look and, uh, and just kind of jump, right. You know, and that requires a really supportive system of people that believe in you, you know, and, um, you know, believe in, you know, if they believe in you so much, or in this case, they've believed in me so much, right? Then you find the, the ability to believe in yourself too. Mm. Surround yourself with people who believe in you. I like that. Yeah. And tolerate you even <laughs> at your worst. <laughs> even more so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Having these conversations gives me so much joy and purpose. We are all part of a wonderful profession. You can live out joy and purpose too. If you liked this episode, please subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch this conversation over on YouTube on the Vet Life Reimagined channel. If you know someone who would be a great guest, please reach out. Until next time.